Good afternoon and welcome to the November 9th, 2020 regular meeting of the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. We thank you for attending this meeting. Your comments and participation is encouraged. To minimize feedback in the audio, all participants in the meeting will be muted until it is their opportunity to speak. Planning commissioners who are virtual should raise their hand in WebEx to indicate that they would like to speak. You can also send the chat to Melissa if you would prefer to be recognized that way. Please be sure to state your name at the beginning of your remarks for the benefit of the clerk. There will be an opportunity for members of the public to provide comments. You will be unmuted when it is your turn to speak. Please wait until the chair calls on you to begin speaking. State your name at the beginning of your comments and adhere to the time limits. If anyone has difficulties or is watching via HTV and would like to provide comments to be included in the record for the local government hearing, please email them to sandy at plancom.org. That's sandy, S-A-N-D-Y, at plancom, P-L-A-N, com.org. For action items, this meeting will be conducted as follows. The agenda item will be introduced. Staff will give their presentation with a 15-minute time limit. The applicant will be given the opportunity to make a presentation with a 15-minute time limit. Following presentations, members of the public may address the Planning Commission when recognized by the chair. Public comment will be heard for three, minute, for three minutes per person. The applicant will be afforded a three-minute period for rebuttal or response. Planning commissioners will ask questions and public comment will be closed. Then upon a motion, a second in discussion, a vote will be taken. With that introduction, I will ask Commissioner Marino to lead us in the prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. All rise. Pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, Commissioner Marino. Uh, with that, I will ask that the clerk please call roll. And clerk, I would request uh, just for this meeting because we have part of the commissioners present and part of the commissioners at home that you call roll commissioners here first and then go through the commissioners uh, attending virtually afterwards. Thank you. Sir, uh, we'll start with you, sir. Uh, Commissioner Joseph? Here. Powell? Here. Dowdy? Here. here. Was Powell here? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Bernstein? Here. Cardenas? Here. Dix? Marino? Here. Now virtually, Cress? Here. Green? Here. Rodriguez? Here. Dickerson? Um, Renee came in and sitting in for uh, Dickerson. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. All right, the next item is the approval of the minutes for the following meetings. Uh, the regular meeting for October 12th, 2020, public hearing on Hillsborough County plan amendments, plan amendments, October 12th, 2020. Is there a motion to approve? Second. I have a motion of approval by Commissioner Marino and a second by Commissioner Powell. Correct. All right. All right. Clerk to take a roll. Oh. Joseph? Yes. Yes. Powell? Yes. Yes. Dowdy? Yes. Cardenas? Yes. Yes. Moreno? Yes. Cress? Green? Yes. And just double checking Bernstein? Dix? 
Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. All right, our second item on the agenda today is the election of officers. And for that, I will turn it over to our attorney, Tracy Robin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start the uh, election process here uh, with the assistance of the chair by leading the nominations for chair. Uh, and after the chair is nominated and, and elected, the chair will then take over the nomination process. Um, and we will ask the clerk to call roll uh, for purposes of voting, as we discussed at the last meeting, uh, so that uh, both the in-person commissioners and the virtual commissioners will all have a, uh, the opportunity to cast their votes uh, with uh, all of the audience hearing what's going on. Uh, so we'll start off with the nominations for chair. You were, uh, last, last meeting, each of you expressed uh, interest in offices you might wish to serve in, and there was a statement of interest summary that was circulated uh, following that meeting. The individuals that were interested in the office of chair are Commissioners Joseph and Commissioners Powell. So they are the initial nominees for the office. Uh, we will uh, open the floor if there are any other nominations from the floor. Would you uh, please make them at this time? All right. Hearing none, um, I will ask the, uh, the clerk to do a roll call vote uh, for either Commissioner Joseph or Commissioner Powell for the Office of Chair. Very good. <clears throat> for for, for uh, Commissioner Joseph as Chair, please, please say yes or no. Uh, Joseph? Yes. Yes. Powell? Yes. Dowdy? Yes. Cardenas? Yes. Marino? Yes. Cress? Yes. Green? Yes. Motion carried seven to zero. Um, I see Commissioner Bernstein and I believe Commissioner Dix is also in the room. And you may want to check to allow them to vote. That was for Bernstein and Dix, ma'am? I, I believe so. I have not heard them. Can I, can I hear, is, uh, is Commissioner Bernstein present? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. Thank you. And Commissioner Dix? Yes. Going back to that, uh, Commissioner Bernstein, we're going back to the votes. This is for, for this vote. Was it a yay or nay? Uh, Commissioner Bernstein votes yes. Thank you. And Dix? Let's make it unanimous by acclamation. Absolutely. Uh, the corrected vote now reads nine to zero. All right. Well, congratulations, Mr. Chair. And I'll turn the meeting back over to you to handle the rest of the offices. All right, thank you very much. All right, for the office of vice chair, uh, I guess, let me check with you, Tracy. Do I have to open it up for nominations for each of these positions or? Yes, what, what we should follow the same procedure of announcing those who expressed interest in the seat and then opening that up uh, for any other nominations from the floor. Okay, thank you. All right, those expressing interest in the vice chair seat, I have Cody Powell and that's it. Double check with you, Tracy, just to make sure I didn't miss any updated information. I uh, believe you might have, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Dix had expressed an interest in the office of vice chair and was subsequently added to the uh, the statement of interest. All right, thank you. All right, then I have expressing interest for vice chair, commissioners Powell and commissioners Dix. 
Now I will open it up for any nominations from the floor. All right, seeing no hands raised and no lights on in here. I will go ahead and ask the clerk to do a roll call vote on either Commissioner Dix or Commissioner Powell. We will start with, uh, this is the vote for Commissioner Powell. Please vote yay or nay. Uh, Joseph? Yay. Powell? Yes. Dowdy? Yay. Bernstein? Yes. Yes. Yep. Cardenas? Yes. Dix? No. Marino? Yes. Cress? Yes. Green? Yes. Motion carried eight to one. Commissioner Dix voted no. Thank you. All right, we will go on to the member at large. Uh, I have for interested parties, Commissioner Dowdy, we'll check again with Tracy just to make sure there was no one else added to the list. And not that I'm aware of. All right, thank you. All right, at this time, I'll open it up for nominations from the floor for member at large. Commissioner Dix. Commissioner Dix. Uh, I would decline, thank you though. Oh, okay. I don't see any hands raised, so I will go on. Oh, well, I guess there's no need to call a vote on that one. It's Commissioner Dowdy, apparently. Um, let me check with Tracy on that. Is that correct, Tracy? <laughs> Is he... uh, that would be correct. All right. Thank you. Congratulations, Commissioner Dowdy. Uh, moving on to the next office, MPO member. I don't have anyone on my list who had expressed interest. Um, I will go on ahead and open it up to nominations on the floor for MPO member. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Commissioner Dix. If I might, uh, since Commissioner Kress has asked to be the alternate, uh, I would like to see if she would have an interest in being the actual MPO member. Commissioner Kress. Hey, Commissioner Green. For that, I know he's done it in the past. I think. Commissioner Kress may have just nominated Commissioner Green. Right, right. Oh, do we need a second? Second. All right. If I may. We have a nomination of Commissioner Green and a second by Commissioner Marino. So we have Commissioner Green for. He had something to say. Go ahead. Ed. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, uh, this is my last meeting. Say again, Commissioner? Not submitted for reappointment from the city of Temple Terrace. So this will be his last meeting, assuming Temple Terrace appoints a new planning commissioner this month. I see. All right, then I guess we will have to look for another nominee. Correct. Uh, if, Commissioner Dowd. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'm curious, Commissioner Green would be, would continue to attend meetings until S Temple Terrace appoints another commissioner, whether he, am I correct in saying he did not reapply? Is that correct, uh, Melissa? That is correct. That is um, and uh, Commissioner Marino, you had been MPO member for the past couple of years and you're not interested anymore? Okay. Um, I, I, I guess I'll, I'll throw my name in the hat for MPO. All right. We have a nomination of Commissioner Dowdy by Commissioner Dowdy. Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Powell. So we have Commissioner Dowdy for MPO member. Is there? Any more interest to nominate anyone by anyone? No? All right. Commissioner Dowdy again, congratulations. All right, moving on to the next office, we have MPO alternate. 
And the only one I see expressing interest on my list is Commissioner Kress. Um, double check that with Melissa and Tracy. Uh, that's that's a, the uh, most current version I have as well. All right, thank you very much. Congratulations, Commissioner Kress. You are our MPO alternate. All right, next up we have ad hoc committees and boards. Uh, I have Commissioner Powell for the Public Interest Committee. Um, oh, sorry, Wait. nominations yeah, for <laughs> taking back to MPO. We're, I think you appoint the rest of them. Oh, do I? Yeah. Okay. Okay, but before I do that, just make sure there weren't any nominations for MPO alternate before I hand it off to Commissioner Kress from anyone. Nope, all right. Again, congratulations, Commissioner Kress. Um, all right, so I guess that's it. All right. Let me ask Tracy, do I have to say they're appointed or anything or are they just understood to be appointed? No. Um, is, is there, are we talking about the committees? Yeah, yes. Yes, uh, those are, uh, I believe those are appointments that are normally made by the chair, uh, and you would need to announce those either at this meeting or at the next meeting. All right, I will go on ahead and announce them now then. Uh, for the Public Information Committee, uh, we have Commissioner Cody Powell. Uh, for the Budget Committee, I have myself, Commissioner Joseph. And for the River TAC, I have, give it to Commissioner Powell. Go ahead. You have a meeting on the 17th, Commissioner Powell. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Jackson. I mean, talking. On the 18th floor. All right, thank you, commissioners. And congratulations to everybody and their new positions. All uh, right, and that takes care of the election of the officers. So moving on to the next item on the list, uh, we have public input. Is there any public input for uh, items not on the schedule agenda? Move right along. Um, next item is Item number four, City of Tampa Land Development Code, Chapter 27, Minor Procedural Changes. And the presenter is Danny Collins. This is Danny Collins. I'm just waiting for my screen to load. Is my screen showing? Yes. Okay, this is uh, Danny Collins with the Planning Commission staff. Um, this is uh, Tampa Land Development Code text amendment um, for section 27 of, of the uh, Land Development Code, um, and it's just minor procedural changes um, to the code. Um, quick background of the request. This is a publicly initiated amendment um, by the city legal department. Um, this was this is being submitted outside of the city's biannual uh, cycle for text amendments. Um, the, there are several um, changes um, as outlined uh, in our report. Um, and just to summarize those changes, um, they correct errors and conflicts uh, between sections and chapters. Um, they're also unifying procedural matters such as public notice provisions. Um, these uh, specific changes will be presented by um, city staff after um, my presentation. Um, the planning commission staff uh, conducted a review of the request and it found it consistent um, with the comprehensive plan, specifically policy, uh, land use policy 
uh, 8.14.1 uh, continue to streamline and development regulations to remove unnecessary requirements or delays in approving and permitting uh, residential development. Um, it was also consistent with land use policy 13.4.1, um, continue uh, reviewing all land development regulations to ensure consistency with the comprehensive plan. Um, based on those considerations, the planning commission staff uh, found the request consistent um, with the uh, City of Tampa comprehensive plan, and I will turn it over to Andrea Zellman um, with City, City Legal. Thanks. And, and good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. This is Andrea Zellman. Um, I'm going to show you a PowerPoint that I believe I showed you at our briefing, but I'll just quickly go through it again for those seeing this for the first time. Uh, And are you all seeing this? Yep. Okay, so you can all see this now, correct? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> all right. Um, as Danny mentioned, this is um, an out of what we call an out of cycle um, Amendment, our code allows us, uh, the code limits the number of changes to the land development code to twice a year, but it makes an exception to those cycles for things that are um, correcting errors, um, make, just making procedural changes. Um, the background of this one is that when the mayor first took office, she convened several uh, working groups, one focused on development services, and there were a lot of recommendations for changes to the city's land development code, which is found at chapter 27. So many of the changes came from that um, team, as well as some were recommended by staff, some were recommended by council, some were rep rep recommended by the development community, and some by um, neighborhood groups. So just, this is just showing you all the different um, changes that the group recommended. And this is just illustrating the fact that we're right now in what we're calling phase 1A, where we're just doing sort of the picking the low hanging fruit and making the changes that we can do quickly. But the city does intend to take a more comprehensive view of its land development code and bring forth more changes. And now I'll walk you through the changes. The very first one um, is, again, and, and if you happen to look at the draft ordinance, it, it's many pages long, but in many places, it's just changing one or two words here and there. So one of the things that required changes to many parts of the code, and it's really a relatively minor change, was to make the public notice requirements uniform for all applications because we had a situation where some applications required mail notice only, some required mail plus a sign, some required a sign only, and we think it's just better for the applicants and better for the neighbors that they have the same level of expectation as far as notice no matter what the application is. And this will also avoid, you know, delays due to missed notice. Um, we found that in our code, in some places, we had references to working days, to city working days, and other places to calendar days. So again, we went through it and tried to catch everything and make it all uniform and have it apply, uh, have, use calendar days when calculating due dates and deadlines for things. Um, Another, you know, sounds like a minor change, but it avoids a lot of confusion. Um, our code referred to Planning and Development Department, or PDD. The city has a habit of changing names of its departments. For example, the Planning and Development Department was recently changed um, to Development and Growth Management. So rather than have to change the code every time the department name changes, we changed it to read department, we define department. So from now on, that will be uniform in the code. Um, a few years ago, the city um, took its tree and landscaping code out of chapter 13 and moved it into chapter 27. However, many places in chapter 27 
still referred to chapter 13. So again, we fixed it to, or we're proposing to fix it to remove that. Um, this was actually a change rec requested by a city council member. There's certain hearings that are held at the city where the um, city council actually reviews um, the decision of a lower board or an administrative um, decision. And we did have a requirement that the applicant submit a DVD of the prior hearing. Well, since all of those hearings are recorded and available online, it seems silly to require anyone to submit a DVD. So we're changing that. Um, we have several boards that can grant variances. Um, the ARC and the BLC do it in the historic districts. The VRB does it in the other parts of the city. And the VRB had a different voting requirement than every other board. So again, this would just change it to make it consistent that a simple majority of the quorum present can um, approve the variance. We had a situation in the city where applicants for a special use alcoholic beverage permitting requirement had to, were being required to submit topographic surveys and tree surveys, which those of you in the business know are, are time consuming and expensive. And it, it obviously makes sense when you're building on a, on a site, you know, a blank site or you're adding to an existing building. But when you say take a restaurant that's already in place, that's already been built for years, and you just want to add the ability to serve alcohol, there's no reason to go back and have to do a tree survey or topographic survey. So again, we're changing the code to remove that requirement when you're not proposing any expansion or, or you know, new structures on a, on a site. This is, um, a, our code allows people to um, make changes to an approved PD when the staff administratively determines that it's a non-substantial change. So here we're just tightening up the language in the code so that um, surrounding neighbors understand that they can then appeal from that decision. Then right now our code, um, has a requirement that a PD applicant send a copy of the site plan to participating neighborhood associations. We had proposed just removing that entirely since the site plans are available online um, at the request of one of our city council members after this was heard at a workshop. We've now tweaked that language somewhat to say that the all of the mail notices that go out will include information about where to find um, digital, uh, you know, digital copies of the applicant's file, including the site plan, because the city has all that available online, but nowhere in our notice letters are people told that. So now they will be. Um, we also bringing the city into the 21st century added language to allow people to submit their affidavits of compliance with the notice requirements electronically. Um, back in 2019, the Florida legislature adopted a bill that basically created uniform deadlines for all local governments to respond to applications for development orders. And so we are just incorporating that language into the code at section 27.153. Um, the city discovered recently or within the last year that we had some outdated references to um, particular um, locations in the city on the stormwater advisory list. So we're changing the um, language to, re to no longer use an outdated term and use modern language. And likewise, um, our code was still referring to the Board of Adjustment, which more than 20 years ago was renamed the Variance Review Board. So again, we're just cleaning up the code to make, make the uh, language up to date. This particular change, it, we're not, it's not changing anything substantial. We're just better describing where people on a residential zoning lot can park an RV and a boat on the lot. Um, this was a change, whoops, sorry. Uh, this final change was a change to correct a scrivener's error. The last time chapter 27 was amended, 
Um, it was amended to require a 15 foot rather than a 10 foot buffer between certain uses. Somehow that change never made it into the published Muni code edition of the code. So we're trying again. Um, and that is, those are all the changes in that like 50 page ordinance that you saw. Um, you can see our schedule here. We're now towards the end. Um, today, obviously, is your hearing to uh, recommend whether this ordinance is consistent with the comp plan. And then we have scheduled this for first reading by the city council on November 19th. And that's all I have. I'll stop sharing now and take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I do not see anybody on my list previously signed up for public comments. I'll open it up to public comments, and I just want to check with HTV and also Melissa to make sure. Okay, I see my HTV guy telling me there's no public comments from them. So I will go on ahead and close the public comment section. Um, obviously, there's no public comments, so no need for a rebuttal. I will open it up to the commissioners for any questions that anyone might have on this item. I see a light from Commissioner Dix in here. No, nope. nope. okay. Uh, let me check online for hand. hand. Raised. All right. Uh, I will close public comment then and open it up for motions for this item. Uh, I move that we find the uh, I move that we approve the attached resolution finding the proposed land development co text mount language consistent the imagine 2040 Tampa comprehensive plan and forward this recommendation to Tampa City Council All right. I have a motion from second. I have a motion from Commissioner Marino uh, for approval and a second by Commissioner Powell uh, is there any more comment on this item questions from anyone seeing none seeing no hands raised I will hand it over to the clerk to do a roll call vote on the item. Joseph? Yes. Powell? Yes. Dowdy? Yes. Bernstein? Yes. Cardenas? Cardenas? Yes. Dix? Yes. Marino? Marino? Yes. Cress? Yes. Green? Yes. Motion carried nine to zero. Thank you. All right, on to our next item, item number five, briefings and presentations. First one, 5A, is an update on the RP2, WVR2 studies and market analysis by Mr. Jay Collins. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Thank you so very much. Jay Collins, Planning Commission staff. Uh, this next item is uh, the first non-action item for you. This is actually a status update for some South County land use studies, uh, particularly the Waimama Village Residential 2 future land use study, the Waimama Community Plan update, and the Residential Planning 2 future land use study, as well as introduce uh, WTL plus A, who is the real estate and market analysis portion uh, of those studies. They are providing input into the studies. Uh, that staff and the other consultants uh, need to further on. So we have reached a bit of a uh, turning page, if you will. We turned the page on this. We actually held four uh, public meetings last week. Uh, those meetings were uh, by your planning commission staff, as well as a variety of Hillsborough County staff. Uh, we thank all of those staff members who worked with us last week. Uh, these four public meetings were community open house meetings. Uh, this is in keeping with the um, community planning guide that we have for updating plans. Uh, there was actually mail notice that was sent to all uh, property owners that are within the affected area. 
Uh, as you can see, we also had uh, a variety of signs that went out into the community. Uh, our websites have the, in the calendars, uh, the emails that went out, or social media contacts that went out uh, to try to get folks to come out to first a virtual meeting uh, that we had in Zoom. Uh, this is the Why Mama meeting. We also had much of the Why Mama meeting uh, with Spanish subtitles for the community that is down there. And we also, with Why Mama, had a variety of uh, folks who could actually contact us in the platform itself, which was wonderful. And then after that presentation, we went into a series of breakout rooms, basically asking folks. I believe we have lost Mr. So I have, uh, this is Marianne Abrahams and I have a backup of Jay's slides if you would like me to share my screen and continue his presentation. That, that would be great, Marianne. Okay, all right, just give me one minute. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, thank you. Okay, great, all right. Uh, let's see. Okay, so okay, so to pick up, um, oh, let's see, let me, sorry, I have two screens going here, there we go. Um, okay, so as Jay mentioned, um, we um, held a series of meetings. So this is a screenshot, um, as he indicated, from the WVR2 virtual meeting. And as you can see here, we utilized um, chat functions. We had the presentations at the head of the meeting um, from the consultants, and then we broke into breakout sessions um, to get some kind of smaller group discussion occurring uh, before we went back to the whole group for uh, a larger Q&A. So this is a screenshot of the um, RP2 virtual open house. Uh, we started it off with this um, engagement activity called Mentimeter, as you can see on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, and we did this for both um, uh, open houses, and um, we got some good um, some good impact, and um, and hopefully that that helped kind of warm warm people up to um, to the open house materials that were to come. All right, so this weekend on Saturday, we um, held the open houses at Waimama Elementary School. Um, and so this is from the um, RP2 open house was in the morning and the WVR2 open house was in the afternoon. And we got uh, some pretty good turnout here. As you can see on the right hand side, we had folks watching a clip of the presentation that occurred during the virtual open house um, in the media center. And then uh, folks went to the cafeteria for more of a Q&A, more of kind of your, your typical open house setup. Um, and, and so we got about, um, I believe, about 70 attendees um, throughout the day. So, um, so that was great to see that people um, still wanted to engage in person. Um, and I think the community appreciated having those options of either virtual or in person. So just a little bit of feedback of what we heard um, throughout the open houses. We had um, some questions on the affordable housing issues in, um, in my mama, um, community benefits, how those are structured, and, um, and also how um, those will be implemented. Uh, we received some questions on that. Um, infrastructure um, issues obviously is, is a big, big issue in um, South County, and so um, a lot of folks had uh, questions on transportation infrastructure and also utilities um, and um, how that would be managed going forward. Uh, we received some questions on um, how this plan is going to impact the Waimama downtown redevelopment. Um, and also a lot of discussion on uh, rural areas needing rural policies 
and what that means and how these policies reflect that. Uh, we also received some questions on uh, clustering provisions and, um, and how the projected growth for the county will be accommodated um, in, in these two study areas. So here is the, uh, the look going forward. We have an online survey now for folks who were not able to attend either open house. We also have recordings up on the web page uh, so people can take a look and then complete the survey. Uh, they're obviously always welcome to contact us with any questions um, or concerns that they might have. Um, and so um, now here we are today at the uh, Planning Commission meeting where next step, uh, the market analysis will be presented. And then going into December, we have uh, the BOCC workshop and the Planning Commission workshop. And then in January and February, the public hearing process uh, will begin. Um, and then it will all be wrapped up um, in May when the moratorium ends. So again, um, so for more information, here are the project web pages um, and the contacts. Tatiana Gonzalez is the project manager for WVR2, and I am the project manager for RP2. Um, so anyone can feel free to reach out with any questions they might have. And uh, with that, I will hand it over to Tom Moriarty and Tom Lavash with WTLNA, and they will provide an update to the market analysis. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Marianne. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Lavash uh, with WTL Plus A, and my longtime colleague, uh, Tom Moriarty with Retail and Development Strategies. And I think we want to share the screen, Marianne and um, Jay. All right, I'm trying to figure out, sorry, how to un unshare my screen. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> uh, okay, there we go. Thank you. There we go. Can everyone see um, uh, the cover sheet? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, commissioners, uh, Chair, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity for us to, uh, uh, to be here today. Uh, uh, my firm was retained in, I think it was December of 2019 to prepare uh, twofold, uh, two studies. Uh, one, a community character profile of uh, Wamama Village and then a real estate market analysis of both the WVR2 and the RP2 uh, designated areas uh, in both Wamama and BOM. Uh, we have a lot of information to cover uh, today, so I'd like to be as efficient um, and as uh, lively as possible. Uh, the market analysis um, uh, started with an, an, um, a, a look at both demographic trends, uh, e uh, economic profile, characteristics, typically what we would define as the drivers of demand for uh, real estate uh, on the ground. Uh, things like population, households, job growth, which is a critical parameter for workplace uses such as office and industrial space, uh, household spending and retail, sort of all of the metrics that we as real estate analysts look at in evaluating market potentials for specific types of land uses. At the same time, we were also looking at real estate market conditions, inventory, uh, housing growth, uh, <clears throat> office absorption, various metrics, again, looking at the health of the real estate market in uh, the study area. All of that information served as the basis for evaluating market or development potentials uh, for those uses as illustrated on the, uh, on the slide. Um, the the uh, staff initially asked us to uh, look at a five-year uh, forecast, a window of, of market potentials. And in some cases, given the, uh, such as housing, given the magnitude of development in, uh, in South County for housing, uh, we took a longer view look, uh, a 10-year analysis. Um, all of this, of course, is intend, intended to inform public policy decisions about specific uh, employment and service requirements in the comp plan and of course, understanding uh, retail supply and demand gaps and a whole host of uh, market related metrics um, in terms of, uh, of the plan. Uh, Tom, do you want to hit on uh, the stakeholder interviews? 
Yeah, so thank you, Tom. Um, the, uh, the initial part of the public outreach here began with a series of stakeholder meetings coordinated by the Planning Commission staff. We had 22 meetings uh, with 40 people um, and th they were deliberately chosen to represent a range of opinions within the community uh, in South County and those involved in South County in the development community. Uh, the opinions were wide ranging from uh, pro growth, uh, continue the growth, increase the growth, sustain the growth to this is not what we bought into and we don't like the kinds of density we're getting. So not unexpected. Um, there was an, a concern expressed by a number of people of what was characterized as the loophole policy in which wetlands and undevelopable land allowed uh, density assigned to a PD to be uh, increased in areas that were uh, not uh, part of the calculation based on gross acreage. Uh, that's, that's what some people called it. Uh, there was a great deal of, of uh, opinion by people who said they wanted, they had deliberately moved to South County uh, because of the rural character, the lower density there, the agricultural land, uh, the slower pace, and they wanted to know what could be done to maintain that and keep density levels on the lower end. Uh, in general, the conclusion was people expect some more growth, uh, but they, the, the preference uh, by most was no more than two units per acre and that that should be net of wetlands or unbuildable land in any uh, future assigned um, uh, entitlements. The development community uh, was um, saw South County as the best place to add continued uh, to add new housing uh, because of the tremendous growth rate that Hillsborough County has had adding 20 to 25,000 new residents a year. That's extraordinary. Uh, and it does need to go somewhere. There was a preference expressed to have that occur in South County. Um, however, uh, th there were also was some confusion. If you can go to the next slide, Tom. There was some confusion about the 2008 employment requirement link uh, that, that was tied to residential approvals with some members of the development community saying this was a new policy. Uh, and at the same time, Wamama residents uh, we're vocal saying we, we, we need more jobs, we need more economic opportunities, we need more basic services that we don't have now. So it was a little unclear about how that goal was to be implemented. Uh, there was a, a wide response, as you heard in the earlier presentation from the planning side, that infrastructure is inadequate. Uh, roadways, lack of sidewalks, parks and recreation opportunities, need more schools because of the population growth and so on. Uh, and water and wastewater issues, uh, but it is the rural services area. So the expectations and the need were not necessarily in sync with how growth has been going. And some people blamed the county for that in their opinions. Uh, and they claimed, uh, they said that the, the costs of putting in new infrastructure were being put on the taxpayers instead of developers. Uh, we, that the development on the uh, community on the other had said that development fees are high enough now uh, and when the discussion came up about why the rural service area as opposed to the urban service area, uh, the comments were that the urban services area was considered too costly, uh, was fragmented and there would be available developable parcels. And there didn't seem to be enough, uh, the word was efficient, but this means large enough to have larger scaled commercially viable parcels. Uh, and then the final concern was the decline in the amount of agricultural land uh, for a number of reasons, shifts in the market, such as the tomato market moving to Mexico, um, the uh, amount of ELAP lands that are not usable for agriculture uh, that constitute open space, but they're not in production, uh, and shifts in ownership where multi-generational farms are being priced out by higher value possibilities that come from developer offers. Um, one of the people that uh, brought this up uh, went back to a 2005 study from the county that analyzed the return to the county on every public dollar spent uh, and noted and had suggested that at that point, which admittedly is 15 years ago now, uh, agriculture was providing a net positive that was pretty substantial uh, and that residential development at that time had been a net negative. So that summarizes the opinions that we heard among the stakeholders. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, we'd like to hit on a, a couple of the, uh, the, the highlights of, uh, of what we found in our demographic analysis. 
Uh, Tom and I have the opportunity and the, the great pleasure to work in jurisdictions all over the country and Hillsborough County, as, as you know, uh, has grown significantly. Um, and in fact, uh, what, 455,000 new residents over the course of the last 20 years in that sustained annual growth of 20 to 25,000 per year, um, which is really, really extraordinary growth. And um, what's, what's interesting is that while uh, we found that um, in both Baum and Wamama in the community plan areas, while the population has doubled since 2000 over the last 20 years, it only represents a growth of about 6,000 people, and that just literally about 1%, 1.3% to be exact, of the growth countywide. Um, another notable uh, demographic um, characteristic in Wamama particularly is that depending on the data source, we found that household size varies. Um, uh, that said, it's larger than the county's overall household size of 2.6 uh, people per household. Um, but the, the largest uh, one of the sources, Esri Business Analyst, um, suggests that the household size in Wamama is up to 4.2 people per household. Um, and that is, uh, we believe, to be illustrative of the diverse demographics and the number of migrant households that live uh, in, uh, uh, in Wamama Village. Uh, the county data suggests the household size is about 3.4. And I share that to note that we'll come back to that in our, in our analysis of housing potentials. Um, if uh, the five-year forecast um, through 2024 would suggest roughly 1,300 new residents in Wamama and about 300 new residents in, uh, in the Baum community plan area. Um, interestingly, the forecasts suggest that growth, the rate of growth will moderate relative to what it was over the last uh, 20 years. And we'll um, we'll see that in the housing analysis. One of the metrics that we look at is uh, 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 incomes and um, spending on retail, as that is the, the direct measure on retail potentials, which is of course an important uh, metric in the um, in the comp plan uh, for South County. So. Uh, what we found interestingly was that there is a significant amount of household retail spending that is leaving uh, both CPs. And when we say leaving, that's also known as retail leakage. Um, it's likely going next door to the cluster of retail in Sun City Center and a little bit further away up in uh, Big Bend Road in 301. Uh, but that from a market, real estate market perspective, it represents to us an opportunity to recapture some portion of that annual spending that is leaving uh, the two CPs uh, at the moment. Um, high household incomes in, in BOM particularly, uh, and of course reflected in high household spending on retail. Uh, paralleling your um, the county's population growth uh, over the last 20 years, a significant loss of jobs during the recession, not a great surprise there. Uh, but uh, you you gained back, and in fact, uh, more than uh, more so, you gained back uh, jobs from the recession. About 442,000 new jobs added um, between 2011 and 2017. And I would note that 2017 is the latest data available for HUD uh, that allows us to examine uh, jobs by industry sector, which is an important metric in informing real estate potentials for office and industrial space. Um, not surprisingly, I think the, uh, given the, the far location of Wamama and Baum in South County, uh, the rural nature of these, uh, of these areas, uh, not many jobs um, as a proportion of, of the county. Uh, it's very small. Uh, and in fact, uh, what Wamama's fair share, what we call fair share, would be about a tenth of a percent. Um, and in fact, what was interesting in this analysis was significant fluctuations in the number of agricultural jobs. Uh, the agricultural economy in the Wamama community plan area is about a third, and it's even more um, of total jobs in BOM. Um, but those fluctuations, as Tom noted, as a function of changes in the agricultural industry, uh, significant growth one year, significant declines the next. Um, if each of these CPs maintain their fair share, of jobs in the future, DEO is forecasting that the county will add close to 60,000 new jobs um, in their eight-year forecast period. Uh, but that would suggest 
roughly about 130 uh, new jobs would be located in Wamama and BOM CPs based on their current fair share. And we'll speak to that um, in the, um, the policy recommendations. We also found that with job growth, the low number of jobs, and with, um, I'm sorry, with population growth, that has resulted in what is a significant imbalance in that residents in the labor force who are living in either BOM or Wamama are leaving. Hence, the, no surprise there, the traffic congestion on I-75. And in fact, the increase in the number of residents leaving to work, to work elsewhere, somewhere else, is, is quite significant. And also the jobs to population ratio is low. Uh, in Wamama, about 11 jobs for every 100 residents, 13 jobs for every 100 residents in BOM, that compares to 44 jobs uh, countywide for every 100 residents. I think the message here is that it reinforces the importance of uh, business recruitment strategies in both locations that will ultimately enhance job creation uh, and of course reduce commuting challenges on I-75. The graphics at the right simply illustrate uh, the dark green bar are, are those uh, people who work in either BOM or WAMAMA coming in every day. The light green bar illustrates who's leaving every day. And you can see the uh, significant disconnect um, between the two and both. We also looked at, um, at uh, housing market conditions. Um, as we've noted, you've had extraordinary growth uh, in housing starts, um, countywide roughly 9,800 per year over the last uh, 20 years, fully 71%, almost three quarters of that, um, of those housing starts, uh, roughly 6,900 a year are in unincorporated parts of the county. Um, a couple of metrics, if, if we can, um, there are roughly 40,000 housing units in Hillsborough County that are what we call true vacant. It's a, a, a unit that is actually available to be um, habitable. Um, that represents about a 6.6% vacancy rate. Um, the industry, industry standard is 5%, so you're slightly above what the real estate industry would consider stabilized uh, conditions. And the forecast suggests roughly suggest roughly 45,000 new households over the next five years. And if we equate a household with a housing unit, this would suggest that some portion of that new household growth could in fact go into an existing unit um, on the ground today. What we don't know is the condition of those units and whether they are functionally and or physically obsolete uh, and, and what, what would need to be done to make those units habitable. This is a graphic that illustrates the number of housing starts um, the, uh, in the, the BOM and WAMAMA community plan areas. Uh, the green dots in the north illustrate the housing that has been built in Fishhawk. This is, I think, since 1995. This is a, a map prepared by the county. Uh, the, the dots in red illustrate what has been built in uh, Riverview. Uh, the blue line is uh, the urban services boundary to the left for the water. Uh, and you can see the cluster of new housing starts located just outside the US boundary, USA, uh, in uh, Riverview. Um, slightly more scattered numbers of housing starts in BOM. Uh, the tan color is uh, RP2, and the purple color is uh, WVR2. And you can see moving south uh, within the urban services boundary, the little purple dots uh, of new units that have been built in, um, uh, in and around Wamama. And the, the county, uh, the Planning Commission and Development Services Department data would suggest that since 1995, roughly 8,400 units have been built in this, uh, this geography. What's striking to us is the number of mobile homes uh, in both uh, community plan areas, roughly 39% in Wamama and 21% in, in the BOM CP. Um, not too many true vacant units, a um, little bit more in Wamama. And uh, again, the forecast would suggest roughly 300 new households uh, five years from now in Wamama and less than 100 in BOM. Um, 
How many of those, again, could go in existing uh, true vacant units uh, is to be determined. We took a deeper dive looking at um, the, the housing starts in both uh, zoning areas. And the annual average over the last 20 years in WVR2 was 80 units per year. But notably, it has jumped to 275 units per year on average over the last three years. Uh, we share this because that has, we've taken that into consideration in our housing analysis. So you can see that the, in both uh, uh, WVR2 and RP2, uh, it has ramped up quite considerably over the last uh, three years. In terms of office conditions, this would be considered a tertiary location. Um, I think the map is quite telling. Um, my apologies if that's difficult to read. This is information from CoStar Inc., which is a, uh, the national uh, go-to source for commercial real estate information. Uh, you can see the cluster of uh, office buildings in both Sun City Center and up on Big Bend Road and 301. Um, that said, that cluster is only about half a million square feet and it's spread across 80, billion, 80, 80 uh, buildings. Um, what we would define in the industry as garden office buildings. Those are buildings anywhere from five or 10 or 15,000 square feet in size. And in fact, this would suggest that your average office building is about 6,700 square feet um, in, these, uh, in these geographies. Uh, typically, they're occupied by professional services, tenants, uh, medical, legal, et cetera. Um, about a third of, of that inventory has been built since 2006. Um, it's driven, the demand for this sort of office space is driven by rooftop growth, by new households. Uh, for professional services. So you can see that the office market is responding to growth in uh, the 301 corridor uh, with roughly 200,000 square feet of, of new office space over the last 12 years. Um, absorption, which is the occupancy of previously unoccupied space, that is a key real estate metric, um, very critical to understand market potentials is is less than 13,000 square feet a year in this submarket. That would basically suggest that the market is absorbing two of these garden office buildings every year. Um, vacancies are are stabilized in the range of 5%. That's uh, that's a positive metric uh, for the office market, but again, driven by rooftop growth. On the industrial side, uh, it would be what we would cast as a mom and pop industrial market, um, uh, small buildings, uh, much more oriented to agriculture or self storage, uh, scattered locations, as you can see from the map, uh, no new construction, limited inventory, um, low vacancy rate, which is a positive thing, um, in our uh, opinion suggests that there may be opportunities for what we call pent up demand. Uh, for the construction of new industrial space. Uh, negligible absorption because there simply isn't the space available to, um, uh, for industrial tenants to lease. Retail, on the other hand, is significant. There's an inventory of about 2 million square feet. Uh, you can see from the map here how much of that is clustered in Sun City Center. Uh, again, um, demand driven by household spending, by rooftops. A lot of national credit, which would be defined as chain affiliated or, or more credit worthy, uh, Walmart, CVS, all of the typical national uh, tenants or chains are here. Um, stabilized conditions, low vacancies, um, fully a million square feet of new retail space has been built um, in this area that includes Big Bend down to Sun City Center over the last 12 years. And more specific to uh, to Wamama Village is the Dollar General and the the Wawa at 301 and 674. Uh, solid absorption. So the the retail market, the metrics in the retail market are uh, healthy in this neck of the woods. What does it mean? So taking all of that information, this is an, a, a map that illustrates that there are fully uh, 2,400 units that have been entitled, uh, where entitlements have been approved in three different projects. Those would be the mustard color of, uh, on this graphic. The pale yellow color are existing PDs that have not yet been fully built out. 
Uh, I don't know, we don't know what uh, uh, units remain to be built in those pale yellow uh, locations. And then the brown color, there are three projects with another thousand units uh, where entitlements are pending and staff, as we understand, is recommending denial for those projects. Um, so potentially there are 3,400 units that could be built um, over the near term in uh, the, this location in the two uh, community plan areas. Um, if uh, indulge us for uh, a second, if you could, what does it mean in terms of market potentials? Over the last 10 years, uh, this is WVR2 um, in Wamama. The, the annual growth rate, rate was just shy of 4% per year. What we did in this analysis was we said that rate of growth 3.9% per year will continue over the next 10 years. It's a fair share, it's a trend line analysis. We then have to divide, have to translate that, that would result in about 4,200 new, 4, new residents. And then we took the three various household sizes uh, because it ranges as much as it does. Smaller the household size, the more units uh, are supportable. So what this illustrates is that those 4,200 new residents at this growth rate would translate into roughly 1,000 to 1,300 new uh, demand for new housing units over the next 10 years. You've already got 2,400 units that have uh, entitlements approved. And that says two things. One, in order for all 2,400 units to be absorbed by the market within that 10-year window, that the growth rate, the 3.9% growth rate, would have to effectively double uh, to absorb those units in this 10-year forecast period, or that that forecast period gets elongated, gets stretched out uh, beyond 10 years uh, to absorb those 2,400 units. We also considered, and by the way, that first scenario, that 3.91%, reflects the what we would call an inflection point, the high growth over the last three years. So that's embedded in that rate. The second scenario is the rate, the trend line rate over the last 20 years, slightly lower, about 3.7% per year. And what that does is it would yield demand for roughly 900 to 1200 units. Again, uh, that rate would have to more than double in order to absorb the 2400 units that have been entitled. And interestingly, we did a third scenario uh, using ESRI, which is a worldwide uh, demographic forecasting service um, operate, uh, used by 120 countries around the world, uh, 20,000 governments in the United States, uh, including Hillsborough County. Um, and they're suggesting in their five-year forecast that growth in Wamama will actually moderate, it will be a little bit lower, about 2.7% per year, and of course, that will then translate into lower demand for new housing, roughly 600 to 900 uh, units over the next 10 years. As a means of testing those rates, we looked at what happens if they, uh, that you continue building at 275 units a year versus, which is what happened in the last three years, versus your long-term average, 20-year average of 80 units a year. According to Hillsborough County, there are roughly 4,900 acres that are developable in WVR2. Assuming two units an acre, that could potentially be 9,400, roughly, housing, new housing units on the 4,900 acres. If the pace of growth at the high water mark of 275 units a year continues, it would still take decades to absorb what is developable uh, in WVR2. And if it continues at the long-term average of 80 units a year, you can see how much, uh, how many years it would take. And of course, this is, these are not hard and fast years, but I think the message is that there is significant land available in South County uh, to absorb a significant number of new housing units 
over a very long period of time. And I would note uh, too that this does not include another 2,181 acres elsewhere outside of WVR2, but in the community plan area where uh, that are developable according to Hillsborough County and that could absorb uh, new residential development. We also did the same analysis for uh, RP2 and there are no uh, entitled or approved projects in our RP2, but basically using the 20 year growth rate would suggest 350 to 400 units market opportunity um, over the next 10 years. Using Esri's lower rate of growth, that comes down to roughly 170, 200 or so units at that sustained lower rate of growth. And similar to uh, WAMAMA, to WVR2, according to uh, the county, there are about 2,700 developable parcels uh, in RP2, which assuming about two units per acre would yield 5,400 units. And you can see at both the long-term sustained housing starts and the, the shorter three-year period of housing starts, how that would translate into a significant number of, of years to absorb uh, uh, units that can be built on developable parcels at these rates of growth. I think the conclusion here is that market demand and absorption patterns do not justify uh, increasing allowable densities in areas that are not planned to accommodate more units per acre. Um, I, well, bear with us with just a couple more. Uh, the, the office market potentials are fairly limited in part driven by the fact that you have so few jobs out there today. Uh, but if Womama maintains its fair share, this would suggest uh, five to 7,000 square feet and bomb even, even less. Um, and it reinforces the importance of continued growth in households. And also perhaps uh, as we will see in, in uh, policy recommendations, um, business recruitment, proactive business recruitment strategies that will induce uh, demand in these locations. A little bit stronger market opportunity for industrial, um, in part because the industrial jobs today are, are a larger share of the pie in both Wamama and Baum. Uh, you have uh, key advantages in terms of low land cost, frontage in 674, uh, relative proximity to, to I-75, all of which are, are, are things that industrial tenants look for. Uh, and notably public ownership, county owned land um, uh, for industrial development on 674. Uh, but you can see the, the sort of order of magnitude in the range of 10 to 20,000 square feet in both locations. Tom, do you wanna hit on retail? Unmute. Sorry, I couldn't find the button. So the retail methodology looked at the unmet retail spending potential in these two planning areas um, and calculated based on industry standards, how much square footage would be supportable in total uh, generated by each area. Uh, the two scenarios that were tested here were framed by capture rate. The aggressive capture rate would be to say that of all of the unmet retail spending, that existing and potential retail would capture 50% of it. The more conservative uh, approach would have suggested a capture rate of 25%. Um, so uh, within that frame, it suggests that aggressively there could be 25 to 35,000 square feet of new retail, conservatively 15 to 20,000. We sort of took the sweet spot in the middle and said there's probably the range of 20 to 25,000 square feet of incremental retail supportable in the near term. Next. Okay. Um, part of the scope was to review and suggest uh, recommended considerations for how existing policy might be changed and to inform uh, the planning studies. Uh, so here are the policy recommendations. We would suggest that you consider modifying the allowed residential density uh, from units per gross acre to units per net developable acre, uh, in part in response to that popular 
uh, the stakeholder uh, comments about uh, not wanting to have so much higher density in the unincorporated part of the county. The second is to adopt a uniform and consistent number of persons per household. That calculation factors into multiple things in the current policy, and it would be helpful if that was clarified and, and made consistent. Um, the 10 square feet of retail uh, that was initially suggested in 2008 of retail space per household uh, is, is aggressive uh, and frankly not realistic, uh, well-intentioned for purposes of providing services in under-provided areas, but it's not supportable and employment growth won't sustain it. So we think that needs to be, uh, you need to consider modifying it. Um, the assumptions that were used in the 2008 population employment retail service requirement need another review now, um, 12 years later, uh, to think about what might else need to be, uh, what else might need to be tweaked or modified slightly. Uh, a number of the interviews discussed the potential for TDRs, and we looked at Hillsborough County's TDR program in detail, and compared to other TDR programs in other parts of the country, it, although again, well-intentioned, it has not been very effective. Uh, there's been very little activity and only much of that only recently. So we think that needs to be supplemented. If you want, if you're serious about it, you want to make it work. It needs to be supplemented with permanent staffing, clearer guidelines, and a stronger nexus between sending and receiving zones. If you want to use that as an effective tool, it's a great idea in principle, but it needs to be workable. Um, uh, we think that uh, the, the public and the general uh, development patterns suggest the need for both a civic and a commercial town center in Wamama Village. Uh, there's population there, but there's no sort of heart of the community. Uh, and we think there's a place for that from both a planning and development perspective. We also think that Wamama Village, because of the number of vacant uh, or, or deteriorating homes or homes that uh, may need to be replaced or empty lots uh, that are not currently in, in under development, uh, require a, a better infill planning and development strategy for, for Wamama Village and within Balm. Uh, and then we think it's appropriate to reconsider that 2005 study that County Hillsborough County Economic Development did to look at the net cost benefit of extension of development by land use and see where it stands now. Uh, the data was interesting to us, uh, but because of the change in ag land and the strong need for more residential, we think it's worth taking another look at what that means in terms of cost benefit. The final element uh, was to look at the five sub areas that uh, were shown on the map at the beginning of this presentation. Um, the five sub areas are the Wamama Light Industrial and Office District. Uh, that one we think should focus on and incentivize uh, agribusiness and other types of light industrial business as prospects for business recruitment. This is the one sub area that has a substantial amount of land owned by the county. So it could be used as a land-based value incentive to draw businesses in here and create jobs close to where the population is clustered and to help drive that more sustainable commercial center. Sub area two is the Wamama, Wamama Town Center District. Uh, and this is an area that uh, has a number of small businesses, a lot of them food-based, they're locally owned, uh, that are uh, an important part of the commercial activity, but they're a little too, um, there aren't enough of them. There needs to, more of a, needs to be more of a cluster. So cluster uh, and incentivize additional growth in that area is the, the watchword here. And then because of the civic side of it, consider adding uh, potential facilities for consumer services and for training. Um, those belong in a civic and commercial heart. Sub area three is the downtown district. Uh, this is the area that is uh, about one third owned by the Church of God. It's where the convention center is, the church and a number of residential properties. Um, and uh, we think they, they were not part of the stakeholder interviews. We think they need to be engaged as a major uh, property owner on both sides of the highway uh, to figure out what their long-term priorities are for their 80 plus acres. Sub area four is the West Lake District moving toward the more active commercial centers. This is close to Walmart and US 301. So we think that will likely evolve into pad site development for national tenants and credit tenants uh, and will be auto related as opposed to what we hope is more walkable in the town center district. And then finally, the West End District, uh, sub area five is where Walmart's located. So those areas should, it's not likely that that's going to be reformatted easily into a walkable 
uh, environment. Uh, so that should likely be continued uh, in allowing it to be auto related commercial use. Well, that concludes uh, what is a significant amount of information in two very detailed reports uh, for your reading pleasure uh, that um, with the links uh, for each um, illustrated here. Uh, and we'll certainly entertain questions. Uh, Melissa, Jay, Tatiana, Marianne, if uh, you want to guide, uh, guide us here, that would be great. Well, we can uh, turn it back over to Commissioner Joseph to see if there are any questions from the commissioners. Yes, thank you for the presentation. All right. Um, no public comment on this one because it's just a presentation. So I will open it up to the commissioners for questions on this item. Seeing no lights here, I will. Oh, Commissioner Powell, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in the future, I don't know if this is something for the chair, or maybe for Melissa. It's really hard to see some of these slides, um, and I think it would be really helpful and beneficial if we could have these. You know, provided to us uh, ahead of time, so that way we can see what uh, is going to be presented to us. Because we don't have a really a whole lot of time to, you know, really dig into to that information. So if there's a way for us to get that, you know, ahead of time, um, even if it's the the night before, at least for myself, it would be uh, greatly appreciated. Um, I, I have several questions, um, but I don't want to take up all the time. But one of the things that two things that struck out to me the most is. It was brought up that there's a, a true vacancy rate of 6.6%. Um, and I'm trying to understand how that may have been uh, determined. Um, and, and was that uh, all of Hillsborough County or was that specific to the RP2 and, and Wyoming Village area? Um, and, and, and of that 6.6, .6, uh, what is that comprised of? Are we talking mobile homes? Are we talking single family? Are we talking apartments? You know, what type of structures are are, are we talking about? Yeah, this is uh, Tom Lavash. Uh, that is an estimate based on the 2013, 2017, I believe, maybe 2018 American Community Survey from the U.S. Census Bureau. Uh, it is their latest estimate. Uh, the The American Community Survey (ACS) does annual. Uh, surveys of uh, specific demographic met metrics such as this. Uh, that is the countywide number. And I would note uh, again that the real estate industry considers a stabilized vacancy rate um, to be 5%. So at 6.6%, you're just, you're slightly higher, uh, but it's not, it's not a red flag by any means uh, in, in our view as real estate analysts. Uh, but it does say that there are uh, some units on the ground today that could be um, uh, could be occupied by future growth, and that was simply our message um, in presenting that number. Okay, uh, it's just uh, it seemed like that was more how it was presented, and I was trying to take pictures of slides so that that was a, a true more of a true vacancy number, and that's definitely something that I would object to. I, I, don't, I don't think that we would have such a high vacancy number given just what I do. Um, but uh, would also note that they that differs from what, what is called unoccupied units, which could be higher, but unoccupied units uh, also comprise units that are empty, uh, for example, and available for sale. Uh, unoccupied units also include seasonal uh, 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 units occupied by seasonal residents, say the snowbirds who come down for the winter. Um, so that's different from true vacancy. True vacancy is, again, the actual uh, number of units that somebody could move in tomorrow. Okay. And, and, and the type of product that we're talking about, I mean, are we talking about single family or, or are we talking about, like, what type of structure? Like what it's everything. It's, it's across your entire housing stock. All right. Um, and... The other thing that, when I looked at your study, I think it was projecting uh, like demand for like the RP2 or Wyoming Village area to be about 800 units by, I think it was 2024, but, and, and you have in here a, a growth rate of 4%, but, you know, I, I understand that from 2000 to 2019, you know, we had 1600 homes, you know, 80 per year. 
but you know the bulk of that really came in the last three years. You know, in 2017 to 2019, you had 825. So prior to that, you had 778, and then all of a sudden you have an explosion of growth in three years. That's 100 percent. So you know, to me, that's pretty clear that there's a lot of demand, you know, for that area, um, and, and maybe that's due to def- cheaper housing. Um, that's where the you know land has been you know available for. Um, you know, development. But I mean, to me, the the growth rate there, I, I think at, at 4% is just way off. I, I don't know. I just don't know if that's just more of an academic number, you know, and you want to take the, the, the 10-year average. But um, I, I think that we should consider, or at least to just point out to my fellow, you know, commissioners that it's definitely been a lot higher than 4% over the last three years. I mean, something, something that right. Right, and and as real estate analysts, that's why we illustrated uh, the slide that said, if you continued at that rate of growth over the last three years, which has been 275 housing units, housing starts a year, if that continues, how many years would it take to absorb what remains developable on the ground? It was a it was a, a, a safety check, if you will, uh, to to see how long would it take to absorb that developable land? And as real estate analysts, we don't wanna rely on solely a three-year forecast. We always wanna look long-term because that reflects multiple economic cycles. I mean, I would agree with that, but the last economic cycle we came out of was, you know, the Great Recession. Um, And so that was, you know, pretty terrible. And I don't don't think that we're gonna ever see anything of that nature with such systemic failures. Um, so I, why I understand that you want to go back and, and look at, you know, a history. Uh, I think that that um, in my personal opinion and just respectfully, uh, I don't agree with that, um, you know, especially when you see such a ramp, you know, rev up of, of growth uh, in a short period of time. And you know, it's almost assuming you're all, really you're saying that you're going to assume, OK, well, it's going to taper back down when, when we're going to have, you know, less when I, I don't think that that's going to be the trend, especially with the amount of uh, people that are you know, moving into Hillsborough County. Um, but last thing is when you mentioned about if we continued on adding at least 270 houses uh, or units, excuse me, for, you know, for the foreseeable future, it was going to take 34 years based on the amount of, of available developable land. It's hard to see the slide, but I assume that that meant the amount of developable land that was in uh, the Wyoming Village uh, area, correct? The amount of developable land in WVR2. Does that also go ahead and... Is that just looking at a raw land aspect, or, or did you go ahead and you net out, you know, wetlands and you know things of you know, that nature? Because you may have 1,500 acres, but whether or not all that's actually truly developable, that's that's another thing. Plus, when you start, you know, cutting in roads and setbacks, you, know, you lose a lot of uh, lose a lot of that developable land. So, so mm-hmm. yeah, Jay. Raw land. Deanna, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Thank you, Tom. This is Jay Collins with the Planning Commission. And Commissioner Powell, you were correct, that is just the raw land. Uh, again, it is two units to the acre there, and you cluster to actually uh, three and a half to four so that you end up having those two units across. So with that idea of the infrastructure that goes in there, we still see many of those developments coming through at or very near two units to the acre. Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Powell. I don't see any more lights on or any hands raised here. Uh, I had a couple questions for myself. Uh, I was wondering, uh, before my questions, I also wanted to ensure Commissioner Powell that this item is for information and it will be coming back before us again for a workshop. And I think maybe one other time, Melissa can confirm that before we actually have to have any sort of action on it. So I'm sure they'll get you a copy of this report that we're seeing here today and you have time between now and our workshop on this coming up to really talk back and forth with our consultants and our staff about your feelings so there's there's plenty of time to get get all of our thoughts in on this so don't feel pressured and as for my questions I did have a question on the retail capture rate that was spoken about I was just interested in getting a little bit more explanation of what that is retail capture rate how does that come about what does that mean exactly for a lay person like me is based on some factor it can be convenience time limitation assortment 
uh, specific need. If you want uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken one day and Pizza Hut, Hut another, those are both de uh, decisions, spending decisions made because of a preference. Cross so, competition. It's the competition, right? So uh, the, the 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 there are spending amounts that are tracked um, by household uh, nationally, and they're regionally adjusted. And there are also uh, in retail viability sales productivities per square foot that make them commercially viable to warrant investment by the store owner, investment by the property owner, uh, and ten, uh, landlord, and so forth. So the capture rate is the effectiveness by with, with which the available retail, or as looking forward, the planned retail, should be able to reasonably capture a share of that available spending that can go anywhere. So we noted that along 301 and Big Bend Road, there's a lot of retail, 2 million square feet of retail already clustered there, a lot of it value and convenience oriented. Uh, that's a significant concentration. And so from a competitive standpoint, it's going to be hard for somebody to open a small business. It'll be harder for someone to open a new small business competing directly with Walmart uh, than it might be if Walmart didn't exist. So the capture rates and the reason they were shown as different amounts was to recognize that that factor exists, that there is a strong competitive context in this area uh, if you have a car, uh, and that the share that down the downtown area of Wimama uh, and the center of Balm might be able to capture is going to be more on the more modest side. So the total supportable, which could be captured by anybody anywhere, we would never have claimed 100%. So we deliberately took something between what we considered aggressive, which would be of the unspent money that's going somewhere now or not being spent at all, you can get half of it to down to, you might be able to get a quarter of it. And it was a blended rate that led us to those uh, potential square footage that we identified for the two planning areas. Thank you, that's an interesting, interesting take on it there. So it's kind of based on, I guess, but I'm speaking in lay terms here, on the, the business's ability to make profit in that area to draw businesses. Is that a safe kind of lay assumption? Yes, sir. Uh, the, 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 in the retail world, uh, the sales productivity factor is, is not just whether people want a business or hope to have a business or have a dream for a business. It's whether they will actually generate enough industry average sales to make that a profitable business for both the landlord, if they don't own the building, uh, and or the store operator. So that sales productivity, as we're seeing now with the effect on small business and all business uh, during COVID, if the sales aren't there, it's very hard to sustain that for a long time and remain profitable. So that, that's, the, that's the basis we use for uh, looking forward to say, what do we think is realistically sustainable? Look at any income growth or anything like that, like, okay, obviously we're looking at how much the business can profit. Have we looked at how much people can spend and growth in that area and how that might change things? Bear with me here while I jump back to, uh, and all of this information are is, is contained in a very detailed set of tables in both reports. And looking, bear with me here, for Wamama, uh, average household income today, this was noted on the slide, is 51,640. It is expected, the forecast suggests, that incomes will grow by 3.4% per year. So that is uh, above the rate of inflation, and that was that is what we would call as economists uh, real growth uh, in income. Uh, by comparison, countywide, the average household income today is a little bit over 82,000, uh, expected to grow to 94,000 over the next five years, um, a rate of 2.8% per year. So I share that to illustrate that with new growth in, in, of, of uh, new housing in the Wamama CP, um, that will be occupied by higher income households. So uh, incomes are expected to grow more quickly than they are countywide. Um, that will bode, bode well for uh, retail, uh, but consider all of the factors that my colleague Tom 
uh, has just mentioned in terms of, um, of retail potentials. That's exactly what I was looking for, the income numbers there and the percentage growth of the income. So that kind of answers my question. You guys did. I did. Okay. In, in BOM, um, household income of 99,000 and change is expected forecast to grow to over 117,000 per year. Uh, that's a significant number. And similar to WAMAMA, a growth rate over the next five years in incomes of about 3.3% per year. So again, higher than the county. A, a little professional question here, your opinion. Do you think that's coming from potentially um, higher paying industries or what, 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 is, what is that? Just inflation? What, what, what do you think that could possibly be those higher incomes, more income? that for households moving into new housing units in WVR2, RP2, uh, or the CPs generally, uh, they're probably dual uh, wage earners uh, buying a new house. So uh, wherever they may work, I think that's probably attributable to that. Thank you. That was, that was it for me. All right, seeing no other lights and no other hands, I will thank you for the presentation. And we will move on to our next item. It is item B, City of Tampa Land Development Code Amendments. West Tampa Overlay, number one, West Tampa Overlay will be presented by David Hay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, David Hay with uh, your Planning Commission staff. Um, Next up is the West Tampa Overlay LDC Amendment uh, Briefing. Uh, this is a privately initiated uh, text amendment to the City of Tampa's Code of Ordinance. It seeks several changes to Chapter 27-241, the West Tampa Overlay District Development Design Standards. Uh, this text amendment is being submitted as part of the January 2020 uh, cycle of text amendments. This briefing is to provide us a summary of that text amendment. Questions are encouraged uh, during this briefing to assist the staffs of the Planning Commission and the City of Tampa to address any concerns uh, before we come back to you all uh, with a consistency finding at the regular meeting scheduled for December uh, 14th. Um, LaShawn Dock with the City of Tampa is here to go through the proposed changes and when she concludes her presentation, both LaShawn and I will be available uh, for any questions. So without any further ado, I introduce LaShawn Dock uh, with the City of Tampa. Thank you. Uh -oh. And I'm not hearing any audio. LaShawn, can you please check your mic? We're not hearing you, LaShawn. LaShawn, this is Dan from Hillsborough County. You might have to uh, exit out of WebEx and then rejoin. Or call in with your phone. Is she going to be able to get on, or we want to move on and come back to it? I don't know if Mr. Hay is still on the line there. I, I'm here. Um, I have not seen the city's presentation as yet. What, if, if Yanika is available, she might be able to do the briefing on the county procedures manual while... Okay, can you hear me now? Oh. Actually, there's LaShawn. Hi, I apologize. Okay. It's okay. I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen again. 
Um, and then I can start the presentation. Okay, can everyone see my screen now and hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, Chairman and Commissioners. Um, again, it's LaShawn Dock. I'm with Development and Growth Management Department. I'm here today to brief you on a total of um, two text amendments, and I'll go ahead and start with this first one as David has introduced. This is the privately initiated text amendment. This is for the West Tampa Overlay Code. Um, one thing I'd like to mention is that this was a, um, a collaborative effort. This was submitted um, with the community redevelopment area um, with the CRA along with the West Tampa CAC. It was a combined submittal privately initiated and they worked with the planning department um, on the language to bring forward. Um, we have Jesus um, Nino, I'd like to mention, he is the recently appointed um, West Tampa CRA manager. Um, the other person that has worked on this really from the beginning, this has been um, an effort that has been going on um, for a couple of years. Um, Carlos Ramirez, he is a part of the West Tampa Community Advisory Committee, and he is the Infrastructure Subcommittee Chairman. And what I'd like to do is just go over the request with you um, and just review the language and the changes proposed. As David has mentioned, this is a part of the January 2020 amendment cycle. Um, as I mentioned, this is an effort that has um, been in process for um, several years now. The goal was to update the overlay code. Um, this is regarding review procedures, um, exterior elevation requirements, design elements, all within the district. Um, also, one thing that we also do that's important to note is whenever we're looking at a privately initiated amendment for a particular section of the code, we also look to update the code in that section and include certain cleanup items. Um, so you'll see those also, I'll review those. So this is a map of the West Tampa area. So this is the West Tampa overlay district identified. So the lines that you see in orange the boundary in orange with the lines, that is the West Tampa overlay boundary. And then the area outlined in yellow, that is the West Tampa CRA boundary. So this text amendment would apply to the West Tampa overlay boundary. So the first section that I'll review with you is the commercial section. So this the changes proposed um, include, first of all, the cleanup. We, Eliminate the department name. We removed all references to our old name, um, two names ago, Land Development Coordination. Um, we also amended some of the submission language um, that was listed. We were requiring submittal of hard copy site plans. And of course, we have our online permitting system, Acela, now, and hard copy plans are not required. So we updated that language. Um, one of the first changes proposed is within a landscape. Um, plan section of the code. Um, we corrected references um, within this section of the code also to any um, of the older versions of the landscape code. Also added is the requirement for the shade tree minimum caliber, um, and that was amended from four inches to three inches. And the next set of changes um, are regarding the principal building. Um, the desire from the community was to have the principal building designed um, so that the principal entry is um, clearly identified. Um, also, there's a change to the screening requirements from 100% to a minimum of 50% opacity. Um, the community really wanted it at 0%, um, the code requires 100%, some type of screening. If you have solid waste provided, you build a wall around it. Um, there was concerns and um, really most of the residents wanted to have true visibility throughout the property. Um, so that was the reasoning for the change in the percentage. Um, also added um, are for properties within the business core district of West Tampa any applications for any um, major renovation or new construction, it shall reflect the architectural design of the majority of the block base. So this is the intent of this change is that over time, there is a consistency um, within the district. 
also added um, more accessory structure requirements. Um, so any accessory structures that are visible from the public right of way, it shall be architecturally finished. Um, and this is anything that could be visible. The intent is to make it complementary with the main structure. Parking standards were amended, um, and this is also um, regarding access. So vehicular access and flow um, shall be designed to have minimal impact on pedestrian circulation. Um, so this is to incentivize or to encourage wherever an alley exists that that be used as the main point of um, vehicular access. Also for structure parking, um, whenever structured parking is developed, um, it must be architecturally embellished and integrated with the overall design of the development. And this is on all sides, and this is anything visible from the public right away. And for new construction and major renovation, um, a lighting design um, plan is required when upon submittal for overlay approval through urban design. And what we've done is through the code is we've updated this reference to um, the requirements and we've updated the current design table and referenced the latest, which is the 10th edition of the IES lighting handbook. That's everything for the commercial changes. So next I'm gonna review with you the residential changes. Um, the first thing was um, the addition of fencing and wall standards. So for chain link fencing, um, the code spoke to the allowance of chain link fencing, but this would clarify and specify that construction fencing shall be removed prior to obtaining a certificate of occupancy. So it's only allowed during construction. Decorative fencing um, is encouraged. And what we've done is added um, fencing material types, PVC, pressure treated wood, um, decorative stone, um, we've listed those specifically within the overlay section of the code. In retaining walls, um, there was a desire from the community to, if at all possible, to keep and retain any of the retaining walls that exist. So whenever possible, if it could be maintained, the thought is to have the wall maintained um, in order to avoid removal. The next section of changes, um, the same for residential. If alley, um, if an alley exists and it and if it is possible, alley access is encouraged. For the roof pitch, um, that was amended from the current requirement of a 612 roof pitch. Now it is a minimum of 412. Um, this is for porches or for houses. Um, what we've done is included pictures just for reference, um, on the left side, you'll see a roof pitch of a 412, and then on the um, right side, you'll see a 612 roof pitch. It's just to show that there's not too much of a difference visually between the two. The next set of changes are regarding accessory structures. Um, the same with accessory structures in residential. They should be architecturally finished um, and adhere to the building style of the principal structure. For accessory parking structures, um, they must have the same design also and not particular features as the principal structure. Whenever it's oriented toward the front yard, um, it cannot be constructed any closer to the street than the front wall of the principal structure. So that was important. The community did not want an accessory parking structure developed in the front of the property or in front of the um, existing primary home. And those are all of the changes. Um, this is the tentative processing schedule. Um, we had, what I did not add on here is we had a public information meeting. It was held on October 19th. We had a city council workshop and that was held on October 22nd. And um, of course, today we have our briefing. Um, the plan is for December 14th. We will come back to the planning commission um, for a recommendation. And then from there, we go to city council for first reading, January 14th, and then city council second reading, February 18th, with a final adoption um, at that time. And this concludes my presentation for this West Tampa language. I'm available if you have any questions. 
Thank you, LaShawn. Uh, David, were you going to make a presentation or was this the only one? I forget what you said at the opening. Yeah, this is just a briefing. So yes, this is the only presentation that we have now. We encourage any questions so we can address them prior to coming back to you at that December 14th meeting. All right, we'll open it up to any questions from the commissioners. I, let me check my online to see if I have any hands raised. I don't think I see any lights in here. I don't see any hands raised. So I will thank you for the presentation, LaShawn, Mr. Hay, and we will move on to our next item. Oh, B2, front porches and permitted projections into required yards. Uh, the presenter is Jennifer Malone. Jennifer Malone here with the Planning Commission. Um, I, uh, I'm just going to open this. It'll be the same format that David um, did previously, but it's a public lady sheet and text amendment uh, <coughs> from the city of Tampa. Again, this is just a briefing, so we can encourage any questions. I don't have a presentation, but the uh, language would allow for uh, front porches to project into those required front yards of the city. And I'll turn it over to Lashawn. And good evening again, Commissioners LaShawn Dock with um, the City's Development and Growth Management Department. And I'll present for you today the publicly initiated text amendment. Um, and this is regarding the front porch changes. And um, can you see my screen? Okay, I believe it is up. So this request is a publicly initiated text amendment. This request was directed by City Council. Um, this is also included as a part of the January 2020 amendment cycle. Um, as Jennifer mentioned, this would allow for front porches to project into the required front yard and residential districts. Um, also for residential development within a PD or within a plan development. Um, what I can do is I'm going to show you this language. This isn't quite as long because this is just a smaller section of the code um, amended. Um, but after we did our city council briefing, this is running on the same schedule as the West Tampa language. We, um, at council's direction, changed to allow um, for the projection also within the overlay districts. And so this is the actual language. This is an amendment to the zoning code, and this is section 27-159, permitted projections in the front yards. And what this will do is it will allow the front porches projection into any other residential districts, that's residential single family, residential multifamily, along with the planned development districts that are proposing residential development. Um, also within the overlay districts, um, it would allow that projection into the front yard. Um, and you may or may not know that within an overlay district, the front yard um, setback is determined in some overlay districts by a front yard average. Um, in other special districts and in some overlay districts, it's based upon the average of the adjacent properties. So this allows for the front porch to project after that average is determined an additional eight feet into that front yard setback. Um, the only requirement is that it just cannot be placed any closer than five feet from the front property line. And this is to allow the structure to meet building code requirements. The final modification to this section of the code is um, within the um, plan districts, within the PD districts. It, a porch can encroach up to eight feet However, the front yard also must remain within five feet. Um, there's no allowance for a reduction of less than five feet within the front yard. And that is the changes proposed for the front porch for events. And um, this is a tentative processing schedule. This was on the same track. Um, we had the city council workshop October 22nd, and we plan to come back to the planning commission December 14th. City Council um, January 14th for first reading and then second reading in February on the 18th for final adoption. And this concludes my presentation. I'm available if you have any questions. 
All right, I will open it up to commissioners. Commissioner Marino, I see has a hand raised. Thank you. Um, Ms. Stock, I just have a question in this part for my own clarification, but um, so then the way this is worded then, um, do, do front porches or will be for, or front porches included in the calculation for the setback for the front of the house? In the overlay district, you mean? Well, I mean, I guess, yeah, but I, cause I was going through and I was looking at the actual section 27. And, and so I guess I was a little confused as to, um, try and go back and forth between the two. It seemed as if the way this is written now, you know, go again, going off of what we had in our, in our packet, it seemed as if this would be allowed across the city. And then, and then we want, if, if correct, we wanted to make sure that we had um, clarification um, just for anyone that is reading or interpreting your code. So it would allow in an overlay district, if you did your front yard average, it still allows you to encroach an additional eight feet into the front, even once that average is taken, versus you trying to incorporate that porch into whatever your front yard setback is based upon an average. You can now come in an additional eight feet to the front. Okay, so then I guess just again, and maybe I'm because I'm I saw what you had on the screen and then the what is in section 27159 and then the um what is in the agenda packet so this is this is not for the entire city then or, it, or is it well it would apply to any residential district the residential single family district residential multifamily district and it applies to any plan development that incorporates that residential use Okay. So okay. The overlay district. So it's not for commercial. So I don't want to say a citywide for that. Maybe a citywide residential. All right. I just want to get that clarification. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you, Commissioner Marino. I don't see any other lights on. I don't see hands raised on my screen, but I did have a couple questions from Ms. Doc. Along the same lines, I was wondering. Well, obviously, like, as you just said, this is going to expand to all residential in the city. Is, is there a restriction on porches now on residential outside the RS 50? Because I see that we're going, basically this was, this was an RS 50 thing before, and we were striking through the 50 and expanding it in the RS category. So my question is, if I had an RS 60 and RS 70 and RS 80 before this, was I not allowed to do a porch in front of my house? Is this the only way for those categories to have a porch? Well, previously, what was um, listed in the code is it allowed for residential single family and residential multifamily um, districts. Um, this specifies and adds in the PD, and it'll add in the overlay areas. They they do have the ability now. If, no, right now, they yes, I'm sorry. Right now, they have the ability to add on the porch within the residential single family and within the residential multifamily. It's 50 RS 60 zoning districts and residential multifamily. And the plan development, and this also allows for additional residential single family districts, RS 75, we have RS 100, um, other residential single family districts within the city. And this will also add in within the overlay and PD. I was saying if I have like an RS 100 right now, I can't do a porch into my front yard. Not under this, you'd have to do it within the required setback. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Marino. Thank you. Uh, so then just to follow up, because the way the, um, the current, the current section 27159, um, the, there's uh, um, may approve alternative design exception. So this would take that out. You could you don't have to get this design exception uh, uh, exception anymore. If you if you want to have a house with a, a porch on it, in R60 or any other uses, you can just design the porch. You don't have to have that uh, special approval. So it, in a way, does this streamline the process? 
Correct. You're correct, Commissioner. It will. It streamlines the process and you don't have to go through that additional step. It is automatically allowed and you can request it at the time of permit. Thank you. And I have one more question, LaShawn. And if I'm understanding, so this is just creating basically an easement sort of to allow for those porches in the front yards. Correct. It's allowing for it. Um, not really an easement because it's still within the property line, but it allows for those porches without going through an additional administrative requirement. It's to encourage it. And when you're looking at infill development, um, it just will encourage the development of the porches instead of someone trying to fit the entire house within the setback. At least now they can place the house within that footprint and still add the porch into the within eight feet to encourage that development of a porch. Gotcha. Thank you. Yeah, I forget we're in legal proceedings, so the term easement probably shouldn't be used for that, but I, I understand. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any more lights on. on. Mr. Chairman. Green. Commissioner Green, go ahead. Yes, um, I had a question. I'm sorry, I can't um, show my, um, my my camera, but I had a question for LaShawn. Um, a lot of a lot of what you just described uh, really relates to the sort of the the uh, the, uh, the existing historic context in West Tampa. Um, is and I'm not I'm not that familiar with um, um, or with Section 20 um, uh, with the section of the code rather, but um, but but does it does it um, does it describe pre-existing conditions um, uh, already established um, community design conditions in the um, um, uh, in the historic uh, in the historic area uh, because it seems it seems like a lot of a lot of what these these um, um, these proposed changes are, are based on those existing conditions. Yes, Commissioner Green, um, it does actually, this language proposes um, that allowance for new and existing structures. Um, so for that residence that already exists, it would allow that addition. Okay, um, I, I, have to, I have to voice my concerns about this, uh, this porch projection um, uh, uh, condition though, because um, I think it's gonna really, uh, and. You know, a lot of houses in, in in West Tampa are already fairly close to the street, or close to the front yes. property line. I'm not sure where you're going to get eight feet from, um, or how you're going to be able to do that. Unless uh, you know, um, um, it's it's even even for an infill, you know, on, on an infill basis. Um, and then two, if someone does it on an infill basis, um, uh, that house essentially could be a lot closer to the front property line than the adjacent um, the the the, uh, the houses on, on on either side. And I think over time that's really going to destroy the streetscape, the historic character of the of, you know of the um, historic streetscape in West Tampa. Um, yes, Commissioner, but that's one thing that we looked at and considered um, when we looked at adding this requirement in the overlay districts um, because it would apply citywide, but also within the overlay districts, when you're looking at West Tampa, um, this is how the block averaging came about in the code for consistency and design. When you look at the block base, um, there is a design pattern. Um, so this allowance within that eight feet, one thing that we considered is that it is an adjustment of eight feet to the front yard setback. Um, also to put that requirement that you can't go any less than five feet. So let's say if you only have six feet to your front yard property line, you won't put an eight foot porch. You just won't have the room. Right, right, right. So okay. we added that yeah, requirement just... to um, that you can't go less than the five feet. So in some cases, in many right. cases, you just won't have the room added. Okay. Yeah, I'm just I'm just concerned about the um, uh, the the you know these changes and how they would affect the um, the historic um, context that's already there, um, and and again, pardon me for my um, my, my ignorance on this um, on this particular section of the of the, uh, of the code, but um, um, but but is it clear that that you know this is you know West Tampa a portion? I'm not sure the boundaries of the historic district rather, and how they coincide with the overlay, but um, 
but is it clear that um, that's what uh, many of these um, these these proposed changes are, are trying to do um, to, to 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 sort of um, uh, reinforce uh, the existing character that's already there. Um, yes. Is there provision? I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. No, I was just I was just curious. Is there is there uh, some uh, some clause or provision that states that states that you know um, uh, early on? So we have the West Tampa language that's specific to West Tampa, and then we have this section of the code, which is under 27159, um, regarding the porches, the front porches, and the allowance of the projection into the front yard. So that intent is there within the West Tampa overlay within that language um, in the beginning of the code. It absolutely is present. Um, okay. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Commissioner Green. I don't see any lights on in here and no more hands raised on the WebEx. So I will thank you, LaShawn, for the presentation and also Jennifer, and we will move on to our next item, 5C, Hillsborough County Plan Amendment Procedures Manual Update, and the presenter is Yanika Mills. Good afternoon, Commissioner Yanika Mills, Planning Commission staff. Let me share my screen. Can you all see my presentation? No, not, no, not yet. I have it ready to go if you need me to, Unika. Sure, go ahead. That's, that's fine, thank you. Thank you. Is it up now? Good afternoon, Commissioner. Janika Mills, Planning Commission staff. Um, as you all know, or may know, um, staff has been working on an update to the um, Hillsborough County uh, Procedures Manual for some time now. And the Procedures Manual basically is the document that guides the process for um, applying for a plan amendment. Um, the procedures manual was first adopted in 1986 in its original form. Each of the jurisdictions had a, a separate plan amendment procedures manual. Um, years later, um, time went by and the procedures manual was consolidated to standardize the process um, for all of the jurisdictions. So there was one manual. Um, and today, um, now we're finding that it's more efficient and because Hillsborough County has some nuances that um, we um, have one manual for the cities of Temple Terrace, Plant City, and Tampa, and we're going to separate out um, Hillsborough County's um, plan amendment manual. So the manual that you have before you um, this afternoon, it has been uh, vetted by county legal staff. It has been vetted by our um, legal staff, Tracy Robin. It's been also um, vetted by uh, planning commission staff as well as Hillsborough County senior staff. Um, and we've reviewed and incorporated all of their edits. <clears throat> so major changes that we've um, incorporated into the document, we have removed any references to the cities of Tam Tampa, Temple Terrace and Plant City. Um, additionally, a portion of the uh, fee schedule has been incorporated into the manual. Um, as you all may know, um, Hillsborough County is the only jurisdiction that has adopted um, an increase in the fee schedule at this time. Um, and we made some minor changes to such things as deadlines of advertising, continuations, um, and supplemental information. 
Um, again, this uh, manual is before you today for your review and feedback. Um, I will be back before you at the December 14th Planning Commission meeting, and um, then it will go before the Board of County Commissions for adoption. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Thank you, Unika. I don't see any lights on from the commissioners here. And checking on the WebEx, I don't see any hands raised. Uh, I wanted to say myself, just reading through this document, Unika, it looked really good. I didn't know that we had this kind of thing. I mean, obviously, it makes sense that we have this to explain things to the community. But just reading through it, 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 it it's a very good document. I like the way you guys use the image and images and broke things down and showed, laid the process out and showed things. I think it's going to be a really helpful document for people who don't necessarily understand the way the process of plan amendments and those sorts of things work. So good job. All right. All right. Thank you very much. And moving on to our next item, 5D, we have Plant City Plan Amendments, and they will be presented by Mr. Mark Hudson. You're muted, Mark. Mr. Hudson, I believe you're still muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, again, Mark Hudson, Planning Commission staff. Uh, the Planning Commission is uh, processing three plan amendments this cycle for the city of Plant City. Uh, and I was going to give you a briefing on all three in quick succession. Uh, I'll be back to you next month uh, for two of those to uh, get your recommendation. Uh, the first one is PCCPA 20-07. Uh, it is located both south and west of South Wiggins Road. Uh, that's because the road bends. As you can see, it is in the southeastern portion of the municipality indicated by the star on their vision map. This is a little bit closer in aerial of the proposed site. Uh, it is surrounded by the lavender dash line. Uh, to the uh, west is the closed coronet mine, and you can see the remnants of some of that mining activity uh, back in the day. Uh, to the uh, west, excuse me, to the east, is, as you can see, there's an agricultural field. However, this map is somewhat, or I should say this arrow is somewhat dated. Today, it is an industrial warehouse for Home Depot Incorporated uh, of over a million square feet. And some of my later slides will show that development. So what is the applicant uh, requesting? Uh, it is privately initiated, is in the process of being voluntarily annexed. Uh, it is over 10 acres, coming in at uh, about 18 and a half acres. Uh, the applicant is requesting to go from its current land use with Hillsborough County Residential 1 to Plant City Residential 4 on the northern portion of the property. And on the southern portion of the property, he has requested a parks, recreation, and open space category. He wishes to develop it as a private recreational training site. And as you can see in the uh, aerial photograph uh, that is on your right, uh, you can see the property. Uh, a ball field has already been developed on that. And immediately to the um, east, you can see the edge of the new um, industrial warehouse of Home Depot. So this is the future land use map as it is adopted today. Uh, you can see basically to the east and west, the industrial uh, plan category, both in the county and in the city. Uh, of course, to the west is the Cornet Mine, which I mentioned previously, and to the east is the Home Depot uh, distribution center. Uh, to the north, there are uh, single family homes uh, with Hillsborough County Residential uh, 2 and Residential 1 plan categories. And this shows you how the map would change if it was ultimately approved by the Plant City Commission. Uh, you can see the north to the north, the color that indicates Plant City Residential 4, which allows four dwelling units per acre, and to the south, the green color, which is Parks Recreation an open space designation for the city. 
So what are the potential impacts today in the county? It could be developed with 18 dwelling units. Uh, that would uh, increase to potentially on the northern half, 34 dwelling units, and also uh, about 107,000 square feet of recreation and open space uses. Uh, we are processing this uh, based on a projected schedule. Uh, we anticipate presenting this to the Plant City Planning Board on December 9th. Uh, just some, a few days later, we plan on presenting Garner new recommendation on December 14th. Uh, as it is over 10 acres, this will be transmitted to uh, DEO, and we have a transmittal hearing scheduled for January 25th, with final action being heard by the City Commission in March of 2021. And with that, commissioners, I stand for any questions. Uh, this, is, this item does not require any action at this time. All right, I don't see any questions in the room. Let me check my WebEx. I don't see any hands raised by commissioners online. So please continue, Mr. Hudson. Uh, let's see if I can. That's the slide, there we go. Uh, the next one is PCCPA 20-08. Uh, again, it's indicated by the star on the Plant City's vision map, which is very close proximity to the Commercial Activity Center Park and Interstate 4. Mark, you need to reshare your screen, please. Lionel, I'm afraid I don't see where to share. Could you share yours? Wait a minute, I see now. How's that? That's good. Okay, sorry for that interruption, a little technical glitch. Um, so this is the uh, plan amendment site. Uh, it is located uh, very near the intersection of North Park Road and East Sam Allen Road. Uh, you can see it's surrounded uh, by the uh, Lavender Dash line. If I can get this into a better form there. Um, this uh, site is in very close proximity to a plan amendment that you heard a couple months ago for the new proposed location of the South Florida Baptist Hospital. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So what is the applicant requesting? Uh, it is, again, it's privately initiated. This is already in the city, so it's gone through the annexation process. It's about 32, almost 33 acres, and the current land use is Hillsborough County Residential 1. And uh, they requested Plant City Residential 9, particularly they're interested in townhome development. This is the future land use plan uh, map as it stands today. You can see the green for the Residential 1 of Plant City. Uh, further to the uh, east is Residential 4 and Plant City. And of course, you can see the commercial corridor that runs along North Park Road between the interstate and Sam Allen Road uh, to the west. And this is how the map would change if ultimately the city commission would approve this plan amendment to the color designate for residential nine in Plant City. And I did wanna take a moment on this slide to um, uh, inform the commission that this plan amendment is being processed at a slightly slower pace than the previous one and also the one I'm gonna talk about in a moment. And the reason being uh, is that uh, you made a recommendation some months ago concerning the new location of the South Florida Baptist Hospital to the west. And there was a plan amendment involved with that, which the Planning Commission did recommend approval. Uh, however, that has not been ultimately acted on by the City Commission, and we expect that to be acted on uh, in the month of January of 2021. And we feel it's important, and also the applicant feels it's important for us to understand the City Commission's ultimate determination on that plan amendment before we finalize our recommendation on this one. So we've slowed the, the, the pace of this one down just slightly. So we have that information of that action taken by the city commission in January uh, to be able to bring that forward to you for your contemplation and your recommendation. 
So what is the potential impacts? Right now, it could have 32 dwelling units that would rise to 295. Again, the applicant's interested in townhome development. Uh, there are some opportunities for neighborhood commercial uses today, 30,000 square feet. Uh, with the residential and plant city, that would rise to 87,500 square feet. And here you note that the schedule is somewhat different than the previous one, as I noted. Uh, the planning board date has not been particularly nailed down yet. Uh, however, it's going to be January 27th or February 21st. I think it's more likely it's going to be February 24th. Uh, planning commission, however, has been confirmed that February 8th and the city commission uh, transmittal hearing would be March 8th with a project projection projected adoption hearing with the city commission in late April 2021. And with that, commissioners, that concludes my briefing on that. Again, this is not an action item, but I stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Hudson. I don't see any lights on in the room and no hands raised for this one, PCCPA 2008. So we will move on to PCCPA 2009. Mr. Hudson, please. An amendment that we are processing for Plant, uh, plant City this cycle. Uh, it's located south of South Frontage Road, west of North Wiggins Road, north of East Baker Street, and east of Charlie Taylor Road. It's adjacent to an existing industrial park that is being uh, in the process of being developed within the community. This shows you the uh, area that is affected by this. This is a pending annexation. Uh, the site is surrounded by the lavender dash line. It consists currently of two uh, residential units. Uh, it is off of um, North Wiggins Road. Uh, however, um, it, it is, the expectation is to bring this into, or at least the applicant's desire is to bring this into an industrial PD, which garners access solely from Charlie Taylor Road. Again, this is a privately initiated, a voluntary annexation. Uh, this is the one of the three. It's the only one that is a small scale coming in at about six and a half acres. The land use today is residential one. Uh, the applicant has requested Plant City Industrial and also to be incorporated into the I4 Tech Quarter overlay as is all the rest of the property to the um, uh, west of this site. This shows you the future land use map as it stands today. It has the green color of residence one in the county, and you can see the gray showing the industrial land uses uh, to the uh, northeast. And also the applicant is in control of the property to the south as well. It does not show an industrial plan category, but it is part of the I-4 tech quarter over. And this shows you how the land use would change if it was approved by the city commission. So what are the potential impacts today? The development potential is six dwelling units uh, based on uh, being brought into the city and garnering this land use, it would rise to 145,000 square feet of light industrial uses would be the primary impact. And this schedule is very similar to the one uh, the first plan amendment I discussed with you, uh, the planning board is scheduled for December 9th. The planning commission hearing is scheduled for December 14th. However, this one does not need to be transmitted initially to the EO. So the adoption hearing for the small scale amendment is scheduled for January 25th of 2021. Uh, again, this does not require any action on your part. I stand for any questions. And my last slide I'll just bring up here just shows you the three plan amendments are processing and their locations and proximity to each other. And with that, uh, Chairman, I can, that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions from commissioners on this item, 20, PCCPA 2009? See any lights in this room? I don't see any hands raised on WebEx, so we will move on. Uh, item number six, uh, director's report, Ms. Sornita. Um. I emailed out my executive director's report on Friday afternoon. Um, it had several attachments to it. Hopefully you all received them. If for some reason you didn't, because at least one of the attachments was pretty large, please let me know and I can resend it. Um, the uh, large attachment was a presentation made to city council um, in October uh, on the 22nd related to growth and the um, many of the growth pressures that the city of Tampa is feeling right now, um, particularly with relation to 
growth in the peninsula part of the city. Um, they are hearing a lot from folks south of Gandhi and in other areas that are within the coastal high hazard area about concerns about growth, um, the infrastructure keeping up with growth and the need for evacuation routes. Um, additionally, they're seeing uh, uh, questions from another a number of other neighborhoods um, in the city about um, growth, the types of zonings they're seeing, um, and things of that nature. Um, the presentation was pretty comprehensive. We assisted with a lot of the data that went into that. You could see um, slides doing analysis of looking at the comprehensive plan amendments and where they have been, and um, that many of those have been in locations that are consistent with the comprehensive plan and where the plan has been directing growth. Um, but the ultimate consensus of the city council was that they would like to see some updates to their comprehensive plan um, in the coming years, and they are scheduled to discuss all of this again at their meeting on, I believe it's November 18th. Uh, I think that's a Thursday, 19th, sorry. Um, the uh, Some of the things that the city is recommending are that we jointly look at the coastal high hazard area policies and um, see what needs to be updated there. Um, the coastal high hazard area policies have been the same in the comprehensive plan for quite some time, but the actual boundary of the coastal high hazard area has changed considerably. So there's definitely an opportunity to refresh our look at um, how we handle that. Um, they've also asked for our assistance in looking at best practices for how to handle and requiring mixed use within the mixed use land use categories. So that's something we'll be looking at over the next uh, few months. Addi additionally, they want to embark on a land use and transportation envisioning process. They're calling moves for the whole city and they've asked us and the MPO to be a part of that. Um, that would include a lot of community outreach over the next year and then culminate in updates to the comprehensive plan, probably in 2022. Um, so we're excited to be partnering with the city on um, all of this. And as additional information comes out for the November 19th uh, presentation, I'd be happy to share that PowerPoint as well. Um, and um, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have on that. And I think David Hay is also in the line in case there are any questions um, on that item. Um, I also have a, had a couple of other attachments. Um, one that I wanted to draw your attention to is the calendar for the 2021 Planning Commission meetings. Um, so that was an attachment to my report and is an important one for you all to take a look at. Um, specifically, we've got all the second Mondays on there, but we have added a special public hearing on January 25th. This would just be in the evening at 530, but that is to handle all of the plan amendments related to the Waimama and RP2 studies, um, because there are, as you have been hearing, a lot of components to that work. We'll be bringing forward all of the recommendations in a workshop next month, um, but there are changes both to the comprehensive plan as well as to the land development code that will be for your consideration. And um, it's, it's a large package. We know there's gonna be a lot of public interest in that. So we thought it was best to have a separate public hearing date from the other uh, plan amendments for that item. And so we would be um, looking to hold that on the fourth Monday of the month, January 25th at 5.30 in the evening. Um, so if there aren't, if, if there's any concern or objection to any of the dates that are on the schedule, um, please let us know. Um, otherwise, Sharon will start sending out schedulers for the coming months. Um, and we will do our best. We've learned uh, in this meeting that we need to make sure those schedulers all get updated with the HTV information. 
Um, we had a, a, a separate scheduler sent also from James Brewer, which we very much appreciated, but we'll make sure all of those are in sync. Um, uh, next meeting will do even better than we did with this first one um, in this hybrid format. Um, the last thing that I wanted to, to mention is that uh, I am the chair of the University of South Florida's Masters in Urban and Regional Planning Advisory Board. We had a meeting last week in which there was considerable discussion about the um, budget cuts and reductions that are being faced uh, by the university and many of the departments, particularly within the um, College of Arts and Sciences. And so um, I just wanted to share with you all that I was going to um, be writing a letter on behalf of the Masters of Urban and Regional Planning program, sharing our experience in both hiring interns and permanent staff um, that has been very positive and, and a big asset to our organization that we have that pool of talent within our community to draw from. Additionally, we've been had a number of projects which professors from the university uh, and the Masters in Urban and Regional Planning program in particular have supported with research and, and um, even having some of their classes do some of the survey work for us. And um, so it is important, I think, that we show our support for the MERT program um, at this time. They're, they're asking for letters showing how their program has had impact in the community. And so that was what I was intending to write. Um, so just wanted to share that, that that was my intention in case anybody had any concerns about that. And that's what I have for my report. Be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Sordita. All right, I see Commissioner Dowdy has a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Melissa, uh, the, um, since this meeting was our uh, election of officers and appointments to boards, uh, I thought it, I'd bring up uh, last year, uh, Commissioner Powell was gracious enough to volunteer for the, that housing board, which was a two-year term, and I brought up the issue of the two-year term potentially being a, a, a conflict with uh, planning commissioners based upon our four-year terms and that we might end up at a position where somebody uh, couldn't sit on that board and I wondered whether or not there had been any more discussions about trying to uh, uh, I don't know get that get that appointment time frame lined up better with uh, with our our terms of office that sort of thing got, got any thoughts on that I do not at the moment. I, the A have made some changes to their bylaws um, around the time where they changed and and called for um, a planning commissioner instead of a planning commission staff person to be on the board. So I will have to go back and refresh my memory on how all those bylaws change is for their board played out. Wanted to make sure you got it back on your list of things and stick it in the back of your brain as something that that could ultimately be a potential problem. So thank you. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dowdy. Commissioner Powell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just so um, Mr. Dowdy uh, recalls, it, it wasn't a, a two year term, like it was actually for a three year term. Uh, so it, 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 it coincided it it well, no, it coincided with um, with my term. So that whenever you know my term is ended, if I you know uh, someone else is going to be able to step in and be seamless. So just wanted you to. It, with, Commissioner Dowd. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. With I, my my point is being that there there may not be some a commissioner with a three year available commitment at the time that it comes due. That's that's what I'm trying to get at is to get it better so it ends up on our our chair's list of appointments every year. Basically, would would make the most sense to me. Thank you. Was there? Commissioner Dix, I see yeah, that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Melissa, on the calendar for 2021, um, I have not had a chance to review it completely, but I just wanted to ask if you've reviewed it to make certain there's no uh, conflicts like we had last month, which was uh, uh, 
it was Columbus Day, and uh, while uh, Hillsborough County was not closed, federal offices were closed, and uh, I just uh, think that it would be prudent to not be meeting on uh, on federal holidays, which might make it difficult for some people to attend either either in person or or online. So, have you had an opportunity to check to to see whether that's the case? Well, I just Googled it, and um, so thank you for the reminder. I had forgotten about that. Um, you are correct that Columbus Day is October 11th, which is the second Monday of no of October. So we can certainly, um, with your all's agreement, move that to uh, the third Monday of October to avoid that conflict. Mr. Chairman, if you need that in the form of a motion, I'll be happy to do that. I just think that's appropriate since it's a federal holiday and, uh, you know, particularly for some of the, either the applicants or for any uh, people that might uh, wish to speak to that effect, it uh, might be difficult or they, it might take them by surprise thinking that we were not meeting. Mm -hmm. So I would move that uh, we uh, hold our meeting the following week. Yeah, it sounds good to me. I mean, I'll check with Chair Tracy. I don't think we need a motion for that. We should just be able to direct Melissa to take care of that. If none of the other commissioners have any objections, I don't see any. So question. Uh, Commission Powell, yeah. Don't we need to first make sure that um, HGTV is available? Yes, I assume Melissa would do that, but I guess I will check with Ms. Zornita to make sure she can handle <laughs> all that. Yes, I, I will certainly coordinate with them if there is a problem with another county meeting being held that same night. Um, we, we have in the past had conflicts with zoning hearing masters and, the, and HTV has been gracious enough to accommodate it, um, but that is before we were doing hybrid meetings and all the stuff we were doing. We're doing now, so yes, I will. I will double check that. Um, and if we need to revisit the October meeting date, I will bring that back at the next meeting. Thank you. All right. I don't see any more questions in the room or any hands raised. I did have a question for you, Melissa, on the city of Tampa presentations for the comprehensive plan stuff. I assume that as that develops, that's going to be coming up to us also, like in parallel, or are we, or is that just going to happen in a closet? And then sometime next year, we're going to have a, a big set of, you know, Tampa comprehensive plan revisions to look at. De definitely not in a closet. Um, most of what we presented in terms of the population projections and some of the um, analysis on a developable um, floor area ratio and density, we had presented to you all probably more than a year ago now when we were doing the projections for the long range transportation plan. Um, but as we move into this past giving them data and into what are some of these recommendations, what kind of outreach do are they going to have, very much we will give you all updates and make sure that you all are a part of that process um, to, with lots of opportunities for input. So um, absolutely, we will do that. Um, we, for example, are planning in January to pre bring to you an update on where we are with the update of a number of the elements to the county's comprehensive plan. So I would anticipate that we would just start having periodic updates and workshops with you all on different topics. Some of these, like the mixed use um, research that they're requesting, um, while it is a specific request from the city of Tampa, the information will be useful to both comprehensive plans and is definitely something we would want your input uh, on before we finalize any sort of report to them on it. Okay, yeah, that was exactly my concern, the two-way travel of the information there. So that's, that's good that you got your eye on that. It makes me feel good to hear you say that. Not that I'm surprised, you do excellent. So <laughs> thank you very much for that answer. Um, Looking around for any more questions, I see none. So we will move on to other business. Um, chair's business, I have none. Old business, any old business? No, any new business from anyone? No, nope, nothing in the room. Uh, committee reports.
Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Tony Rodriguez. Commissioner Powell going. I'll grab you right next, right after him. Sorry about that. Um, so for the uh, 30th Annual Planning Design Awards that was uh, presented by uh, Tico and our marketing partner, uh, Tampa Bay Times, I um, want to say a thank you uh, to them. Uh, staff was uh, really great, nimble, and able to turn around uh, an in-person event that, um, you know, uh, into a virtual event in a short period of time. Um, Carolyn uh, Charles produced the video. We've had, uh, I believe, about 650 uh, views uh, since it premiered uh, on October uh, 27th. In the coming uh, weeks and months, uh, we'll be uh, personally uh, delivering uh, the Crystal Trophies uh, to the winning uh, projects. And uh, we'll also, I believe, more towards the end of the year, we'll have uh, an accounting on the financials as well and how we did. And um, I am sure that I believe that will come out, you know, positive. But we'll have to take figure that out at that point. Um, so that takes care of that. And then for uh, Affordable Housing Board for the AHAB, uh, we did meet uh, this morning, uh, and it was uh, uh, fairly brief. We didn't have anyone there for uh, public comment. Um, the uh, uh, the land trust uh, did not meet um, because they are still uh, in limbo until there's a um, a study done on from the Florida Housing Coalition on how to best form a, a CLT and, and everything. So that's still being you know vetted out, um, and uh, really nothing else uh, to update on. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, the uh, City of Tampa had their Affordable Housing Advisory Committee meeting on October 21st, and uh, a couple of the announcements, and uh, I, I believe that fairly fairly common knowledge now, but uh, uh, we, we do have a new Director of Development and Growth Management at the City, which is Abby Feely. I, I want to mention that because she is really a, a great advocate for affordable housing in our community. Um, she uh, she she worked she worked uh, diligently on that while she was in her private sector position, and so we're looking for great things uh, as the new director. Uh, also, I had mentioned last month that uh, we were going to be getting an elected official on the uh, committee, and uh, so I'm happy to welcome uh, Councilman John Dingfelder onto the uh, committee for that. Um, our next meeting will be on Wednesday, November 18th for the uh, city's affordable housing advisory committee. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rodriguez. Uh, did you? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Commissioner Marino. Thank you um, for the MPO meeting on uh, November 4th. Uh, they discussed uh, system performance targets related to um, uh, transit and uh, some of the other um, performance metrics. Uh, that the MPO is looking at going forward. Also, uh, an MOU with um, some of the Central Florida MPOs work on the I-4 corridor. And then there is a discussion about the legislative agenda and really legislative uh, priorities for the MPO. And one of the things that uh, came up was the potential for Hillsborough County and, and this uh, part of Florida asking for a change to how uh, transit is funded via the Rail Enterprise Fund and maybe allowing fixed guideway transit like BRT. Uh, to be included as projects that are eligible for that funding. Thank you, Commissioner Marino. All right, seeing no other lights on and no hands raised on the WebEx, we will move on to. On to <laughs> this meeting is adjourned. Thanks a lot for everybody joining us. Um, our next meeting is 530, so we will see you at that point in time. Thanks a lot. Meeting adjourned.